and I guess we are live right now. Are we? Yes, we are. Okay, uh, so it's currently 1 p.m. Um, at 1 p.m. we can uh, start. Uh, Jim, uh, first of all, uh, thank you uh, for being with uh, with me today. Uh, thank you, Ronan. Good, good to good to talk to you again. Yeah, good to talk to you. It's true that uh, the last time uh, we saw each other, and uh, um, I mean the oh, the last time I got the idea, in fact, to interview you was when uh, you made a, a live stream on on LinkedIn. Uh, just for our audience, uh, just to let you know that this is the third uh, meeting that I'm holding with uh, SEO practitioner or SEM practitioner. Uh, the two previous ones were about Switzerland and uh, the Netherlands. So I had the chance last time to interview uh, my friend Jean-Marc Courtiad, so as uh, JJ Brammer uh, from the, the Netherlands. And today, this is the third uh, SEO journey. Uh, that's the way I call this. Uh, uh, th those interviews, the idea is uh, to interview uh, SEM uh, practitioner from uh, the different markets in which they are evolving in order to explain to, let's say, <coughs> expatriate foreign uh, SEO practitioner how, the, how they can enter within a given market. Uh, today, I have the chance to be uh, with uh, Jim Banks, so SEM uh, practitioner in the United Kingdom. Jim, you will have, of course, uh, the chance uh, to introduce you in a couple of minutes. Uh, but I just would like to uh, remember to uh, our audience that the idea is to have a 60 minute talk, 45 minute talk. Uh, you are free to send your questions on YouTube. I guess I activated the chat. I'm not 100% sure that I can follow the question at the same time, but definitely I will do my best. And uh, the idea, of course, is to give uh, pieces of advice, hints uh, for people who are doing SEO in order to know, okay, how should they practice SEO if they were targeting this specific country? In our case today, it's going to be uh, United Kingdom. And um, I'm going to have the first question for you, Jim. Uh, the first is, could you please introduce yourself to uh, our audience and explain us uh, what is uh, your position when it comes to search engine optimization and let's say search engine marketing in general? Yeah, so th th first off, thank you for uh, for obviously inviting me to come and uh, talk to you today. Um, I really appreciate the uh, the opportunity to kind of do that. Uh, again, I, I, I've been involved in, in the di I call it the digital marketing space for 22 years. Um, I started life as an SEO, um, and then I realized very quickly that um, for me, the opportunities to succeed were going to come in paid media, right? So really, probably since the year... 99 2000 i've been primarily a, an, an sem practitioner um but you know but but that that obviously i've worked um i've run my own agencies i sold my first one um i'm running an agency now which i set up in 2012 so it's like nine years old um and what i found is that you know the the kind of the link between seo and sem is very kind of tight right and certainly i worked in-house at a uh, travel company um, and we found that, that the SEO and SEM teams working together was what made the, the team a success, right? I mean, it's it's when when th companies try and do things in isolation, it tends to kind of not go quite so well. I think when there's collaboration between the silos of, of the different businesses, they do well. So, so the current agency that I have now is called Spades Media. Um, as I said, it started in 2012. Um, and we really we're, we're what I call a growth agency. So we work primarily with um, businesses that are e-commerce. Um, we we work primarily with businesses that run on Shopify. Um, and again, that's just for us to try and niche down to a, an area where we feel we can add the most value. And what we're really looking for is businesses that are probably you know reasonably well established. So maybe doing around about a million pounds a year in sales, uh, maybe between one and five million that are looking to grow to sort of between five and 50 million, right? So that's sort of, for us, that's our sweet spot. That's where we feel we can add the most value. Um, and we do that kind of in, in a variety of ways. Obviously, uh, we help manage the paid media for companies. We also do native advertising. We do video advertising on, you know, YouTube and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, we do, um, you know, a, a fair amount of sort of CRO and, and that's not, sort of our core competency. But what we found is that, you know, paid media is not a magic wand, right? If you have a bad website, bad user experience, then, you know, the the traffic that you buy or, or get organically isn't going to convert as well as if you actually take the time to understand who your user is, 
how they interact with your site and what you can kind of do to improve the performance overall. Okay. Um, you already mentioned a lot of things I'm, I'm curious about. I'm sorry for that because with, uh, with all my guests, I'm drafting the question over here. That's okay. the, the, the question <laughs> by heart, but uh, you mentioned things which make me think about other questions. And um, you said like, uh, you said one word, which uh, I think was fun, or at least maybe I misunderstood it, but you say Swiss spot, am I right? Sweet spot, yeah. Oh, you say sweet or sweet spot, like sweet spot, yeah. So, so for us, it's it's almost like a what is the ideal thing, right? So, if if oh. if it was, you know, if it was dating, you might say my perfect um, woman is this tall, this color hair, oh. you know, this size, you know, that's that's kind of like your sweet spot. That's 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 where. I mean, that's not to say that we only work with companies that are in that space, uh -huh. but what we found is that we get the most success. Um, and we have the most enjoyment out of working with businesses that are that type of business. Okay, sorry, I just understood it like in Swiss, like in Switzerland, like uh, oh, no, spaces no, no. on which there are money, like Switzerland spot or something like this. Sorry, no. for, that. sorry for the confusion. Sweet, sweet uh, spot. Okay. Um, yeah, another question. You say that you started like uh, SEO 22 years ago. And mm -hmm. um, I I'm wondering at that time in the UK, how it looked like uh, SEO education at that time? Was it like a set of several websites which were coming from the United States, or were there already some authority, uh, authoritative organization in the UK who were already spreading the word about SEO? If you can remember what happened 22 years ago, because uh, as you know, I'm, I'm from France, so I know a little bit uh, how SEO looked like as its infancy in France, but I don't have a clue about how it looked like in the UK. Was it drafted directly from the USA or was it uh, did something start 22 years ago in the UK? Um, yeah, I mean, like, interesting enough, I, I struggle to remember what I had for breakfast this morning, <laughs> never mind what happened 22 years ago, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, but yeah, I, I think what, what was really interesting, sort of back back in the day, sort of in the in the very early days, what we found was that there was a lot, a lot of uh, the, the kind of activity that happened came from the US, right? There were some some fairly well-established kind of UK businesses that, that were doing um, you know, like, like different things. And I think a lot of the businesses that were doing well in the UK were sort of offshoots of US based businesses, right? So we had like, um, look smart was a business that was in the US, and they, they sort of set up an operation in the UK, Microsoft, obviously, with MSN, you had sort of MSN um, in the UK as well. Um, there was again, there was lots of different sort of uh, regional variations. Um, the Demos directory was kind of like very popular at that time. The Yahoo directory is very popular at that time. Um, you know, and obviously they both had sort of UK versions of their directory. Um, I mean, this, again, this, this was sort of 1999. Um, and at that sort of point in time, you know, Google was really a fledgling business. I mean, although it existed, it really had only just started. So what we found was that, that at that particular point in time, it was a much smaller company, right? So our access to people at Google was much better than it is now, right? I mean, now it's very difficult for you to actually get physical access to people that work at Google. Whereas back then, I mean, we used to kind of go to conferences to, to kind of um, meet up. Um, and there would be always people like Matt Cutts would be there, right? And we would sort of be able to kind of sit down and have a drink with Matt Cutts and talk to him, right? And he was just as interested to, to talk to some of the, the, the kind of I call them serious SEOs. I mean, I wasn't a serious SEO because by then I'd really switched to kind of paid search, but I was still involved, right? But, but um, you know, it, it was very much a case of Matt would sit and talk to people and, and learn from them as much as, you know, like we, we were trying to help educate Google. They were trying to help educate us. Um, and it really, again, it was, it was a lot of fun. And I think really sort of pre-IPO Googlers were probably the best people for us to hang out with. Right. And I think when the point that Google became a publicly traded company, right, things changed. I think they had to change just by virtue of the, the kind of dynamics of how that works. But, um, but yeah, but it was, it was, you know, it was, it was fun. And I think the thing I liked about it, it was, it was very much like the wild west, right? It was much easier to rank sites for things. It was all about keyword stuffing and, you know, like hidden stuff off the left hand side of the page. And, and, um, you know, a lot of the sort of things that we now know to be black hat, that, that, that was kind of really how things were done. Right. So, you know, it would be literally sort of spend a bit of time. You could rank your site number one, somebody else would do something, they'd rank number one, you could do something, they you'd rank number one. It was very dynamic at that point, mm -hmm. right? Whereas I think now, obviously, it's changed significantly since then. Okay. 
Um, th thank you for, for sharing uh, with us all, all of this. Do you have in mind already, if, if you were, sorry, that's as well a, a question which was not listed. Um, dealing with the UK, because for us from, let's say, sorry for the, the terminology in the term, but from the outside, I would say, uh, it, it's hard for us to identify what is a US website, what is a UK website, and what are the most authoritative UK website when it comes to SEO. For example, in France, I have in mind, for example, uh, webrank.info, webrank.info, Abundance, uh, SEO Camp. Uh, those are the, the French website that I can clearly identify from uh, authoritative SEO practitioner from ages or uh, organization. Um, what, what are the big names when it comes to SEO in the UK? Uh, the, the, the website on which we'll find about the list of the events organized in the UK or either uh, education, uh, educational format, support material or, or whatever. Uh, do you have any of those which come to yeah, you? Yeah, I think I think in mu in much the same way as like back in the in the very early days, there was a lot of people from overseas that would come to the UK, right? I think the the same thing kind of still applies, right? I mean, you know, you you obviously have um, events like Brighton SEO, right? Brighton SEO is 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 by far and away the kind of the biggest SEO specific event, right? Um, you know, again, it it sort of start, its origins were in in a pub, and now it's like a huge event, right? And um, you know, and I think really, you, you know, you, 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 if you kind of look at it, there are so many overseas speakers that come to speak at Brighton. One because it's cool to travel, right? Mm -hmm. Or at least it was pre-pandemic. It was cool to travel, right? And hopefully it'll be cool to travel again, right? But, um, you know, you had a lot of people that wanted to come because they'd heard such great things about Brighton SEO, right? They heard great things about the UK. They wanted to kind of come. They wanted to kind of meet up with people. So that that was when a lot of people got the opportunity to kind of, everyone got to, to meet all at the same time, right? Um, and I think when you when you kind of look at it, I think it's the, the international flavor of, the actual um, the audience that makes it kind of as dynamic as it is. I don't necessarily think that there are specific UK, this is the authoritative site, because really, I, I think in a lot of cases, the sort of, you know, the UK and US quite often get sort of set, um, treated as the same. And I think one of the challenges, I mean, certainly when I worked for the, um, the travel company, we had a .co.uk and we had a .com and the .com was really targeting the US and the .co.uk was targeting the UK, right? And for us trying to kind of make sure that, that the audience that we got was the one that was the one, one we were targeting and help to educate the, um, you know, the, the, the search engines that we wanted you know, the .code at UK to show if people are in the UK and .com if people are in the US, mm -hmm. right? That was a challenge, right? And that was where, you know, we, we would obviously lean quite heavily on on things like href lang to make sure that we could kind of understand it. Because even though it's the same language, right? It's not the same kind of experience that you're offering, right? Again, I'll give you an example. I'm working with, with a company now who um, is a US-based company and they're pushing really, really hard, right? I've just literally just started working with them quite recently, right? They're really pushing hard because they're trying to promote Mother's Day, right? And they're really pushing hard in across the world for Mother's Day. And I said to them, you do realize that Mother's Day in the UK was in March, right? And Mother's Day, obviously, everywhere else is in May, right? May the 9th is Mother's Day, whereas in the UK, it's already passed, right? So the fact that they're promoting an event that has already passed is kind of just down to that lack of education. So I think in some respects, that's one of the reasons why it's beneficial to have kind of boots on the ground in a local market to give you the understanding of what are the different um, nuances of how things work in, in, a, in a particular market differently than other places, right? So again, like localization, I think a lot of people focus on just translation, right? So they might, if you know, the word color in the US doesn't have a U, whereas in the UK it does. Mum is an M-U-M -M here in the UK. In America, in, it's M-O-M, -M, and I'm sure in France it's what, mum, mamon, or something like that, right? So it's, it, again, it's like understanding those nuances and how they, how they can kind of impact the overall success of your campaigns. Currency is another one, right? Again, like, you know, I see so many companies promoting things, um, and all the currencies that they show me are in dollars, right? And I'm like, I am never going to buy anything in dollars, right? It's just, I, I know that, that obviously I buy a lot of things in, in dollars, like a lot of the tools that I use 
for my kind of agency day to day, right? I pay for them in dollars, right? Because that's just the way they're set up, right? But it's like, you know, if I have the choice of buying something and it's it's showing in pounds, then I feel that I'm dealing with a UK based company, I will feel more confident to make that purchase. Whereas if it's showing in a different currency, right? Um, I'm going to feel a lot less comfortable about making that purchase. Okay. Uh, th that will come back to a question that I have uh, that I have later on. Um, okay, I have a good one. Uh, that's the second one. You have been prepared to this one normally. Uh, as you know, English is the most uh, common used business language in the world. Uh, does it mean that when it comes to SEO, I mean, you are like, oh God, I mean, even if it's for the UK, you are getting a lot of results coming from uh, the, the US website. It's kind of hard to rank uh, your client website uh, within the within the, the SERP or do you say to your client okay those we just remove them because those are indirect competitors you can clearly see your speech I can already tell you that those are US based uh, I, I can give you in, in France for example we are kind of the opposite it's kind of easy to go and and push some French speaking language website to Canada it's, it's no big deal because there's not that much competition and we are seeing from time to time websites which are coming from Canada, but de definitely that that's not like a huge competition. So uh, I don't want to be impolite here, but I guess that you guys may have the difference on which you are kind of spammed with a lot of US uh, based website on google.co.uk. Uh, I don't know, maybe you could just. No, yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and again, I think for, for me, it's it's. Um... You know, again, that that tells me that that company hasn't done a good job of optimizing their site to target the right audience, right? Because again, if you think about it, I, I I always kind of say, any any time we work with a company, right? As much as I care about my customers, I care more about their customers than I care about them, right? So for me, it's much more about providing their end users with a great user experience, right? And a great user experience means you you present the right kind of sort of products at the right price, in the right currency, in the right location, with all the right payment mechanisms. Again, like that that's to me, that, and, and ultimately if you can do that, then you've got a much better chance of one, ranking better, two, kind of getting more sales, right? Because ultimately that's that's what most companies are looking for. They're looking for more sales, right? And, you know, it's not just about getting traffic, right? And, um, you know, I think, again, as an example, so, in Germany, I mean, I was working with a, with a a big brand that had kind of like a global presence, and they were really struggling in Germany, and they were really struggling in Italy, right? And they couldn't understand why the performance in Germany and Italy, even though we're getting lots of traffic, wasn't anywhere near as good as it was in other countries, right? And you know, when you actually start diving into sort of some of the local nuances of why things work in a certain way, right? In Germany, right, most people in Germany don't use a credit card to make purchases they use something called gyro pay right and gyro pay is sort of like it's a little bit like a direct debit but it's sort of that gives you the mechanism to make that payment right and you know as soon as we put gyro pay in as a method of payment for this client right their performance went through the roof right in italy it's slightly different right italian people and again i, I don't mean to kind of like I'm not knocking Italian people, but Italian people are much slower at making decisions. So they tend to kind of do many, many more searches for something before committing to make a purchase, right? So whereas, you know, you might get a three or 4% conversion rate in the UK, in Italy, it might be one or 2%, right? But you, you'll you probably then find that the traffic will be cheaper because there's less competition. And it just, it, you know, it's just, ultimately it's, it's really just about providing the kind of the right journey path for people to kind of get through right based upon where they're located right and and certainly here in the uk again i think sort of a couple of things that i i would always recommend people do right if you're promoting like either seo or or paid media right if you use a .co.uk that is a really strong signal of i'm dealing with a local business right even if you're not a local business i mean i, I work with clients who are based in america but they have a .co.uk, they've got a VAT registration, right? They, they kind of like they set up a company here, right? To make to, to, to make sure that people feel like they're dealing with a, a kind of UK-based business, right? That gives com, com, the, the end user more confidence to kind of make a purchase. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know about the, this part. Uh, 
would you be able to answer to this given question, which is about how much does it cost for a foreign company to set a business in the UK from the outside? I mean, is it like you need definitely to have a physical presence or do you have any services which allow you like for 100 euro or something like this, let's say 100 pound? Yeah, uh, so, so, that, so there are definitely some company formation solutions out there on the internet. I mean, again, like the, the sort of companies that I've helped set up, I mean, I think it, it's a couple of hundred pounds to actually sort of incorporate a company, right? So that gives them the kind of the limited company, um, you know, the business registration, they can obviously buy a domain. Again, there's no there's no problem in them buying a domain anyway, they can use whatever address they want, but it makes a lot more sense to kind of buy an off the shelf company, mm -hmm. right? So you can get get like a postal address with it. So it has like a UK postal address. Um, again, it, it it really depends. I mean, if you're if you're going into it sort of like fully, right? Then obviously there's a lot more things that you might want to do. You may want to enlist the help of a call center to actually answer telephone calls with a free phone number, um, something like that, right? But you know, maybe just to kind of get things off the ground, mm -hmm. right? What I would probably suggest if you want to test the water, maybe register a domain, use your US based address to begin with, right? Once you've actually established a decent presence, a decent volume of sales, right? Then you can look to incorporate your company, um, you know, and, and then that will give you the ability to kind of, you know, register for VAT and do all that sort of all the things that, that kind of um, come with that. Oh, good. Um, I have a more uh, localized question. You know this one because we already discussed it about it, but I think it's good for our audience to, to know it. Um, so, you know, from, from a foreigner perspective, you are uh, what we call the United Kingdom. But then for us, at least uh, if we are considering uh, rugby uh, <laughs> or even um, other sports, we have in our head, we have England, we have Scotland, we have Wales and we have uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, just talking here about what I call, let's say, mainland. And uh, are there any differences between targeting those different parts of the United Kingdom? Because in my, let's say, former SEO head, I would have said, okay, if tomorrow I want to, to target the Scottish uh, audience, for example, I will definitely look for a domain name, which is in, in I don't know if the word Scottish exist but uh, maybe a TLD which will end up in something targeting in order to say okay this is definitely the market uh, that, that I want to to talk to and um, f first of all have you seen any of those strategy is there any need for that are there any uh, things that we should know in terms of languages or dialects or whatever we, we call them uh, th yeah so so I, th I think sort of g generally speaking like the 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 UK is treated like as a as a as a single entity, right? That's not to say that you shouldn't think local as well, right? It's again like the population of Scotland is about four million, right? Um, whereas if you look, the population of London is about thirteen million, right? So London is about three or four times, three times as big as Scotland is in in total, right? Scotland is a big geographical area, right? There's much much more geography in Scotland, right? So again, what you may want to kind of factor in is if you're trying to deliver to some of the outer islands in Scotland, then, you know, offering sort of next day delivery might not be possible, right? Because they might only get there two or three times a week, right? That sort of thing, right? So it's just something to kind of bear in mind when you're trying to sort of factor in some of those nuances. I mean, in, in Wales, there is a, a Welsh language, right? And there are certain parts of Wales where more people will speak that. But again, I think everyone in Wales will speak English, right? In the same way that in Scotland, there are some kind of, again, some, 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 some dialects, but most, it, like everyone will speak, in, will, will speak English, right? And, and generally speaking, it is the same language, although there are some regional variations. And even in England, right, there are different regional variations for people up from up north and versus down south versus in the west country in devon and cornwall right different people will talk differently down there than they will sort of in the center of london i mean and again what you need to bear in mind is that so if you take say london and big cities right generally speaking they are major conurbations of um people from overseas right so again like although the population of london is sort of 12 13 million um certainly up until the pandemic a lot of those people were from overseas, right? So they were South African, they were American, um, you know, they, they, there's a, a multi kind of cultural, um, diverse mix of people in 
in and around the big cities, right? And and understanding what some of those location based specific issues are, right? So again, there are parts of London where you know it's a huge Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Indian kind of um, community, right? Because they they tend to kind of congregate together, right? Um, Chinese, same thing, right? So so it's really again just trying to understand some of those nuances. So everyone's British, right? But within that, there all there'll be some sort of sub cultural differences that will make the way in which things happen differently, right? So in 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 certain parts of the UK, you have much higher occupancy in in a house, right? So if you're trying to do granular targeting of a campaign based upon a location, right, you might find that there could be twelve people in one house, and and um, you know if you're trying to sort of target a specific gender or age, it's kind of you know it's going to be that much more difficult to kind of get that dialed in. Okay. W would you say, uh, that's as well just a curiosity question, which was not listed. Would you say it would be shocking if we uh, go for a website which is just targeting the, the Scottish uh, or the Welsh? Or uh, would you say that that would be like a very, very targeted campaign or let's say... Uh, it we, again, it, it really depends. I mean, like, so, so again, like, if, if you look at it, I mean, like here in the UK, there is so much decimation of the high street, right? So, so many big department stores are shut down because they're taking their businesses online, right? So all of a sudden, the kind of the challenges of geography have gone out the window, right? So all of a sudden, you know, if you're again, if you're a, let's say you're a Scottish company that makes tartan just for just for, you know, just for sort of stereotyping as as, as badly as possible. But you, you're a Scottish company that makes tartan, right? And you you historically, all you've done is you've sold tartan in a shop by some seaside village, Right now, all of a sudden, we've had the pandemic, which has meant that you've had to shut for a long time. So you may well have switched kind of um, to actually sell your products now online. Right. And all of a sudden, instead of just selling to the people that can actually drive to your shop, all of a sudden you've got an international audience. Right. I mean, in theory, there's nothing to prevent you selling your products anywhere in the world. Right. Other than obviously logistics and operational stuff. Right. But there's no reason why you couldn't kind of broaden your horizons. Right. And I think that's been one of the big kind of catalysts and drivers. I think there are so many businesses now that have taken off their blinkers and they can now actually look at things in a different way. Right. And they are trying to sort of broaden their horizons. Right. So I think, you know, if, if a business is only focusing on trying to sell things to Scottish people. Right then I think, you know, that's th those are the sorts of businesses that will struggle to exist in the future, right? I think the ones that are kind of thinking more more globally, right, will be the ones that will, will kind of thrive and survive. Okay. Um, mm -mm. Well, the next question was about, have you seen any, let's say, uh, website which are playing with those, let's say, cultural differences, uh, location in order to make uh, better SEO performances but as you say that's probably not the direction in which uh, the, yeah, the, 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 the one thing I would say on that Ronan is that that like so so my, my agency is a HubSpot partner right and what we find is that um, you know if you think about the website experience so let, let's say um, I go to Amazon right if I go to Amazon right Amazon always offer me a different uh, experience than they would my wife or you know my grandchildren or something like that right so so it's kind of like um you know they personalize the user experience based upon what they know about me right and what they know about my sort of previous history so again like you can see in my studio because i haven't been traveling to speak at conferences right i've taken my speaking at conferences to kind of doing it online now right so i've invested quite heavily in microphones and lights and cameras and stuff like that right so again, anyone that looks at my sort of Amazon history will say, okay, so Jim's obviously involved in photography and lighting and blah, 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 <laughs> right? So, but but what they're able to do is they're able to offer suggestions to me based upon that history, right? And I think, you know, the companies that are actually customizing the user experience to each individual based upon their interactions with a company in the past, right? is are the ones that will succeed right so again if if people know that you are a returning visitor or a returning kind of customer so again like you might be a returning visitor you've never interacted or bought or or you know filled in a form but if somebody has returned and and you can say i know that this is ronan he's spent 
a thousand pounds with me over the last 12 months, right? I'm going, I want to treat you differently than somebody that's just coming to my website for the first time, right? And that's obviously the challenge of how do you kind of rank well organically by right? providing a good experience for a search engine versus how do I look after my customers by providing them an experience that is more, you know, sort of tailored to their specific requirements, right? And that's where I think, you know, we, we, we will use um, sort of personalized content, right? So if people are in a particular list, we can say, right, if they're in this list, this is the content that I want them to show them. And that could be the imagery, the, um, the wording, the, the headlines and all that sort of stuff, right? Um, but again, like on the paid media side of things, what we tend to do is we tend to kind of, um, you know, again, th th if, if I can give people one thing to do that will take their business forward dramatically is, you know, the SEO team will always want to kind of do things on the site, which will be detrimental to the SEM team, right? So I always suggest to people create dedicated landing pages for your SEM team so that they can take away all the things that get in the way of people's experience towards getting to where they want to get to, right? So again, if, if you're targeting cold traffic, i.e. people that you know have never bought from you before, right? There is absolutely no point in you having a login button on the top navigation of the site because they've got nothing to log into. They've never been, they've never bought from you before, mm -hmm. right? Whereas if it's an existing customer, that login should be, almost like like you shouldn't even have to, have to ask them. It should automatically log people in if you, if you can, right? And if not, you need to make that really prominent based on the fact that you know that they're a returning customer, right? Because that way they, they may well be looking to come and buy something, but they may be looking to, you know, complain. They may be looking to come and, you know, do something that's different than what a, a kind of a non-buying or a first-time visitor has, right? So again, if you look at new visitors versus returning, new, uh, new will always convert at about half of what a returning will, right? So for me, it's just really a case of trying to find a way you, you can kind of do that. So what we we do is we create dedicated landing pages. We no index, no follow them to make sure that no search engine is going to kind of find their way to them, yeah. right, by accident, right, for duplicate content, right? And then that way we, we've kind of got a an environment that, that the, the SEM team have more control over and they can kind of do better things with. Okay. Um, I have another question, which is more about like a business oriented one. Uh, let's say British history is, <laughs> is huge, is huge. Uh, there are different, uh, countries. Um, I'm thinking about islands, uh, let's say like Jersey, like, uh, Guernsey, like Isle of Man, uh, like St. Helena, for example. Have you ever, ever, ever been, or have you ever received a, a contract or a prospect uh, in order to target any of those islands for a niche market? But my big question here behind is, uh, are there any niche markets for those uh, different, uh, let's say, territories, countries? Uh, it's just a curiosity question because the British history is made of many uh, different countries. Yeah. So again, I, I think what, what you need to kind of bear in mind is that, that if, if you look at, um, you know, like Guernsey, Jersey, Isle of Man, I mean, those are primarily places that if, if you have British people that go there, they go there primarily for as a sort of tax haven, right? So that's the reason that they've kind of gone to those, those I say the countries, they're not countries, but they're, you know, islands, right? But they're, so, so for me, it's really just a case of, you know, it, yes, if you're targeting a particular, you know, let's say you're in financial services, you want to tr target people on wealth management, those might be good places to target, right? Um, you know, but but yeah, I mean, I, I think obviously they are very, very small, right? So it's it's one of those things you need to kind of factor that in. You've got to try and look at sort of critical mass versus sort of, you know, drilling in. And, and you know, again, I think if, if, if like I said, I think in most cases, the people that do the targeting and do well are trying to encourage local local people to come and visit them locally. So it's typically somebody that is based in Guernsey that might be, you know, trying to attract other people in Guernsey to come and see them physically, you know. But it, it, it would probably be more sort of B2B. But other than that, you know, it, again, it, it really is, um, you know, taking that sort of the local 
kind of targeting off off the table you know they've been affected by pandemics just as same as everyone else right so hopefully some of the businesses there have now kind of internationalized their business based on um kind of you know what what they needed to kind of do for for their ongoing future really okay um next question is about uh well that's uh that's not a pandemic question but that's as well uh, one about short history does brexit uh kill some uh, let's say SEM opportunities i mean have you seen that uh, you get less demands due to the fact that uh, the uk left uh, the eu or uh, not at all um so, so again i mean I, th i think um you know i mean Bre brexit for people that are have been selling physical goods that, that kind of moved backwards and forwards across the the kind of the channel right have definitely been impacted by brexit right there's there's no two ways about that um i think you know i think the reality of it is is that you know um that there will be opportunities right but it's just going to take a little bit of time for that to kind of bed in i think when you look at it i mean the sort of the, the actual proper transition to brexit happened at exactly the same time that we're right in the throes of this pandemic so i don't really think the implications of it have really been fully fully kind of been impacted right so i think you know once that kind of once that changes and things do get back to a little bit of normality then i think we you know we should be in sort of a better position but you know but i think i know i know certainly the the um the sort of the, the the government here in the uk have spent a lot of time trying to help educate small businesses on what they need to do to kind of be ready to trade with the european union right and and obviously we're now in a position where historically we've had to rely on european union negotiated trade deals with other countries right we're now in a position where we can negotiate our own trade deals with other countries like australia and canada and so on right so you know but again i think i think those sorts of things will will just take a little bit of time and i think really sort of like if you look at the seo sem community i mean we've been a very international group of people anyway right you know again like a lot of my good friends are all based in america or europe right so we kind of travel to, to other conferences so again i used to travel to the states probably three times a year at least right and i would meet lots of people from europe lots of people from the uk i mean funny enough some of my best friends in the uk i met them in america right and now we're friends here in the uk so it's kind of weird that that i had to go to another country to actually meet somebody <laughs> um but you know but that's that's just the kind of the, the way things go but i think um you know i think because we're not physic we're not selling physical goods I think the barrier to entry for us is much, much lower, right? We don't have the same challenges and issues as if we were sending sheep across the kind of the channel in a, in a container, right? That's a completely different, um, you know, a different ball game. Okay. Um, I have a question dealing with uh, more like the strategy when it comes to uh, going abroad. Um, are you, let's say, sorry for the name, are you using the Republic of Ireland as a test market in order to go international? So as we do, for example, for France with Switzerland and Belgium, uh, is it like, okay, we want to go international. We are a UK based company. We want to go international. Then we are going to set another version of our website, which is targeting Ireland or, um, is it not the first market that a UK based? No, it, 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 think about? it wouldn't be the first market. And then yeah. the reason for that is because it's too small, right? Again, like the Republic of Ireland is just too small as, a, as an entity, even though, like, you know, Facebook's got their European headquarters there, Google's got their headquarters there, Adobe's got, the, like, there's loads of companies that have got sort of a presence in Dublin, right? But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, it's too small a, a, a kind of a market for, for us to kind of, make that the first foray into it. I, I think obviously the the one reason we, we might is if we were just trying to find a a sort of closely aligned English speaking market, then that might be a good logical kind of place to kind of go. And I think, again, I see a lot of people make the mistake. So Northern Ireland, right, is actually treated as United Kingdom, right? Whereas Ireland, which you see in like most country drop downs is where a lot of people target because they think they're targeting Northern Ireland, right? So a lot of people like target it like inadvertently, not because they want to, but because that's what they think they need to choose from a drop down. Okay. So
So would you say that a UK based company when they go international, they mostly think about, okay, we go for the US or we go for Europe, but maybe more US because it's yeah, I th again, I think it really depends, Ronan, on what you're selling, right? If you're if you're selling a product, right? I I think really the the internationalization of it will really be governed by who do you think will be the market that will buy the most of that, right? So again, like in in a lot of cases, um, it, again, it's it's really trying to find a market where English is very common, and that's not to say it necessarily needs to be the most common language, but it's a common language, right? It could be that a particular country has a big expat community, right? So again, like a lot of um, British people have gone to the United Arab Emirates, to Dubai and Abu Dhabi, right? Um, so again, it may be that's a market you kind of, kind of go after because, you know, it's, um, you know, English is, is sort of prevalent over there. Uh, but yeah, but I, I certainly think the US would be one of the markets where a lot of people would go to, um, you know, but again, like we've see, sort of seen situations where, we, we get a lot of traffic from a particular market that we didn't realize we were going to get. And then what we can then do is look to sort of spin up um, kind of a proposition to try and get, make that a kind of more prominent marketplace. Right. So again, we've, we've sort of gone from the UK and the next market we've kind of taken on is Japan, right. Because of the type of products that my clients been selling, right. Japan seemed to be the next logical place to go. Okay. So there's, there's no sort of like, yeah. it's, it's not, governed by science it's more sort of common sense and what what the market tells you uh, i'm sorry if sometimes you see me looking at uh, somewhere i'm looking uh, at my phone in order to see if someone is asking us some questions uh, i have the feeling that there's no any question within the chat but the problem is i'm checking on mobile so maybe i'm not seeing the question the right way um okay. yes i have a, a great question for you actually they are all great but this one uh, may be the one key uh, so it's kind of basic for you but just to let you know that maybe for the people who will look at this video it won't uh, i'm thinking here i'm gonna put my french hat on and the thing is that uh, most of the webmasters they think okay i have my domain name in dot fr uh, we have a great product or we have a great service we are gonna target uh, an international audience by translating our website they put it within a folder named slash en so it's dot fr slash en uh, what is your position regarding that kind of let's say strategy if we are thinking in terms of uh, seo performances okay so definitely uh, this guy who set this website this way and translated this way and put the strategy this way thought about okay if i do it this way i will target uh, any UK resident, so as any US based resident, and same thing as Australian citizens. And uh, what do you think about his strategy? Will he get some good results, bad results, uh, pros and cons? Yeah, so so again, I, I've seen a lot of companies that will will use like a subdomain. So they'll go like, you know, fr.brand.com, right? I've seen others do sub directory. Right. So it'll be, you know, brand.com forward slash FR. Right. Um, again, like when I think when you when you look at sort of like href lang, right, that's usually when you get the sort of the additional uh, the additions of the, you know, en dot FR or whatever it might be to kind of um, to, to tell you or or whatever the, the kind of en to, for, for English. Um, again, my, my, my view is that, you know, to kind of if you if you're looking to just test the water right then you know whichever route you go down is fine right if you're looking to, for something that's a lot more permanent right then i definitely think having a localized tld of the country that you're targeting is a is a definite kind of winner that's the the route you need to go down because again like i said be, the the content on the on the site needs to be different right you know, and it's it, it it'll be too easy for people to find other content that's not relevant to their location, right, on the site if you haven't kind of gone to the trouble of trying to isolate it, right? But it, it but it is important that you you know you understand you know how the traffic's arriving at your site and how you can kind of route it to the right place, right? Because again, I think you know one of the challenges is that you know in, in a lot of cases people will automatically assume. 
that you know if somebody comes in with an ip address from a particular location that they need to route them to the relevant kind of country for that particular marketplace and again it could be i'm in the uk right i travel to romania right to kind of you know to speak at a conference or something right i'm still british right and they shouldn't just assume because my ip is in romania right that i am i am kind you know that they should sort of route me to to kind of um you know the dot dot ro or whatever it might be right because you know you've got to just think about what what's going to be the most relevant so i don't know if that answered the question but it's you know i, I think like i said i think starting out the the kind of the fake it till you make it sort of solution would be you know by all means use a, a kind of subdomain or a subdirectory um again i i prefer i think subdomains look cleaner mm-hmm. right so again like if you if you're a I, th- I think the challenge is if you're using a country like dot, dot .fr, right? I don't think anyone in in America or anyone in the UK wants to see a dot .fr, and I don't I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, right? To any French business, but it's just that's not what they're looking for. If they see dot .fr, most people know that's a French business. They will look for a dot .co dot .uk first, and then a dot .com. Okay, that that's a great transition for the next question. Sorry, but I'm looking at the time. At the same time, I still have like a dozen of questions to ask you and we have only 15 minutes left. Uh, in the history, we tend to see a lot of .co.uk and then at one time came the .uk. Uh, so to me, it's a bit confused. Uh, could you explain us if you know the history of the .uk, why do they open it up? And uh, let's say if you are a business tomorrow, what should you do? Uh, let's say you should purchase the two, which one should you choose .co.uk or .uk? Um, yeah, so I mean, so I, I don't know if uh, there's a guy in Australia called Jim Stewart, right? And um, he he obviously got, got involved because they had the same thing. There was a .com .au, right? And then a new kind of registrar came out with a .au, right? And and basically, unlike in a lot of countries where you know if you own the .co .uk, right? then you should be given first first dibs on the .uk, right? Whereas in Australia, they didn't make it that way, right? So you could have spent a huge amount of money building your brand on a .com.au for somebody else to come along and basically get the .au instead of you, right? There was no guarantee that you would be the company that would get that .au, right? And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, it's it's confusing, right? In the same way that, you know, a lot of these sort of new TLDs, the .shops, the .com, you know, agency, the dot, whatever. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of messy, right? Again, I think, I think it's almost like I need to kind of get it out of my own head, right? Because again, I'm, I'm a purist. I've been around forever. I'm always used to seeing dot coms in the States, dot co dot UKs, dot FRs, dot CAs, right? In the countries that they're based, right? But I'm not the, the kind of the intended audience, right? And, and I think in some respects, most most people are a lot a lot less bothered about what the domain even is right they don't care what the domain is at all right mm-hmm. so they just care about whether the you know if it's a, a, a serp whether the serp actually has the information that you know they're interested in if it's a paid ad that the paid ad has the information that they're interested in and they'll click through right and the, again for me the most important thing is that it's got to be secure Right. If they get to a site and it's not secure, that's not going to be a good user experience. And I think, um, you know, for me, again, I don't think it matters .co.uk or .uk as long as you have, um, you know, an, an SSL certificate on it. Okay. Um, well, uh, I think I didn't prepare this question, but um, I think you already mentioned it somehow. But how could you identify that there is a strong uh, competition on the SEO market for a given uh, for a given keyword are you using uh, like tools in order to identify the number of backlinks and based on the number of backlinks which are coming from the UK or do you not make any difference here about backlinks which are coming from the UK pointing to a, a UK website or the one who are in fact maybe less competitive but they have more links which are coming from US based uh, website putting some links toward the UK website do you have any information dealing with this yeah so so i mean first off i mean as you know i primarily do sem right so for me like although i i know a lot about seo it's not my core competency um but you know i think for for me it's really just a case of 
you know, again, like going back to the good old days, like again, things like a Yahoo directory listing and a Demos listing when you had the page rank, Google page rank, like that would give you a page rank of four, just doing those two things, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then if you had like .edu's, they were more valuable, right? Um, if you had the domain name in the URL, that was more valuable. Again, I think I think Google and, and search engines have moved on a lot since then, right? And I think the the proximity of the domain to the location is less important. It's more about how authoritative the the domain is on the topic that you're you know the link is that you're kind of getting is from, right? I think again, I think we're we're at the point now where you know like Apple just Monday, so just two days ago. Uh, they pushed out their sort of iOS 14.5 update, which now includes app tracking transparency, which is going to it's going to disrupt heavily the uh, the kind of the advertising ecosystem. It's also going to disrupt the publisher ecosystem, right? So I think what you'll start to see is a lot more publishers that historically were kind of giving out kind of their um, the links sort of willy nilly. I think a lot more of them are going to become like walled gardens. Right, because they need to kind of keep control of their own destiny, right? So I think you'll probably find that, that that there will be a lot less links given out, so that the authority of the links that you have will be more valuable potentially. But again, it's like it's it's constantly changing, right? What I say today may not kind of apply tomorrow. For me, I mean, again, I think the, the kind of the most important thing is you know you use all the tools that are available, your Majestics, your asset. SEMrush, your in-links, um, you know, they, they, again, there's, there's Moz. I mean, there's, there's so many different places you can go to to, to kind of get the information. Um, but, you know, but as we all know, nobody buys any links, right? So, <laughs> um, so I have, um, uh, you, thank you, you answered to a lot of questions which were uh, coming next about the different technologies. So that's, that's great. Uh, one that I have is that is there any UK IT workforce at all um, when it comes to tools or technology to use? I'm making myself maybe more, more understandable, but uh, for example, in France, uh, the IT workforce is is it uh, quite uh, uh, quite low? For example, we are really dependent from uh, GAFAM uh, technology, so we use the word GAFAM for Google. Amazon and Apple and, and the, or the others. Is it the same thing in the UK or are there any, let's say, IT workforces that uh, you can identify big companies which have, which can provide technology such as CMS, such as um, any kind of things. Uh, I, Majestic SEO, I think is a UK based company, I'm right? Uh, yeah, yeah, so they're based in Birmingham. Oh, okay. Do, do you have any other names like Majestic SEO that we may not know in um, all over the world or which um, at least uh, we don't know? No, in I UK mean, like, and... again, I think most, most of the sort of tools are kind of like they're, they're sort of overseas, um, but the tools kind of work in the UK as well as, as other markets. Okay. Um, are there any pieces of advice that you could give us in order to build our first link in the UK? Uh, for example, um, I know, for example, that in a, it, when I used to work on German project, I was struggling a lot in order to know, okay, what are the different websites on which I can put a link on, whereas in France, as it was like, probably less mature than in Germany, we had like plenty of directories or any SEO footprints that we could use in order to easily identify let's say blogs, places in which there was easy spots to insert links on. Um, what, what is the mentality, let's say in the UK dealing with all those backlinks? You almost already answered to this question, but uh, if you could. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there, are still, there are still some some business directory sources available where you, know, you can kind of build links through those. Um, and, and obviously they offer a freemium model so you can kind of get a free listing and then if you want to enhance the listing you can kind of pay extra money to kind of do that um, I don't again I don't really know to what extent they add great value mm -hmm. right to to kind of like you know to, to the, the, the kind of the value of your site based on the, the value of the links I mean I would hazard a guess because it's a directory it doesn't really add a huge amount of value right whether it's just a box ticking exercise to say yeah I've built Ten links or whatever it might be. Again, I think the most important thing is, you know, if you're creating good content, right, then the links should come organically, 
right? Mm -hmm. So I think, again, for me, the most important thing is, again, if you look at people like Aleda, right, who is Spanish, right, but she is uh, widely kind of uh, touted and, link and linked to based upon, you know, the content that she puts out, right? She does like a huge amount of content. She's got sort of a YouTube channel. She does like, uh, she was doing Clubhouse. She's now doing Twitter Spaces, right? So she's kind of, she's offering a lot of value in the content that she puts out, right? Which means that a lot of people will link to the sites that she's talking about, right? So, you know, I think just, just by doing kind of good content, you'll get good value links kind of pointing through. Mm. And uh, do you have any any website uh, that, that you know or you could purchase some links or are there any uh, any known services or any no. things like this? Okay. I, I mean, honestly, even if I did know, I wouldn't I wouldn't tell you now because like I'd be putting them out of business. But okay. no. <laughs> um, um, do you know any translation services uh, that you would recommend in order to get uh, UK translated content? Is it like Fiverr that you would recommend or that kind of website in order to get a... Uh, well, I guess um, you are not the one that we're going to knock at the door to in order to make some translation, but just... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I think I've been, I've been fortunate mm -hmm. over the years to, to kind of do a lot of travel, right? And I've had the opportunity to kind of meet a lot of different people in different countries, right? So usually if, 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 if I have a, again, I don't even look at it as translation. I think translation is probably 60% of the success you'll have. It's that localization, which really makes the difference, right? That's the, you know, that's where it's handy to have people that are physically located just because, you know, again, you could go to Fiverr, give them a, a 400 word, you know, blog post, Somebody will kind of run it through Google Translate and go, here you go, here's your here's your website, done, right? Um, you know, that that wouldn't be kind of what I would do. Um, again, I, I've got a good friend, Michael Bonfils, who runs a company called SEM International. They have a huge kind of network of local people that do sort of like content creation for SEO purposes, physically located in those markets, right? So they would be the sort of people I would go to to kind of get that work done. Because one, not only can they make sure that from a like language perspective, things are kind of like ticked, boxes are ticked, right? But I think from a localization and nuance, they would un understand the nuances of what that content needed to be. What, 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 you know, what sort of content should be produced in the first place, right? Because we can't just assume that because a 500 word blog post works well in the UK, that mm -hmm. the same blog post would work well in Sweden or something like that. Okay, uh, one last question. Yeah. Uh, which is about, uh, could you please tell us, if you know, uh, the different obligation that a webmaster need to fulfill when it comes to the UK? The questions come from the fact that, you know, when uh, when we want to go international, we just, uh, we do the like 80% by doing the translation of localization, let's say, of the content, which means that the remaining legal parts, let's say somehow is, I'm not going to say one of the list of our concerns, but probably we want to have those concerns once we get our first client. So most of the time as pushing out a website is kind of easy. We push the button, we see how it goes within the listing and we don't care about the legal things, even if we definitely we should. Um, for example, I know that in, in Germany, for example, you shouldn't publish something if you don't have your impression page and page about privacy. Uh, because yeah. that, that's really big, a big thing for them. In France, it's, uh, we are claiming this is a big thing, but uh, I haven't seen anyone sued because they don't have any, any pages about this or anything. So I just yeah. would like to know about the UK, when you have a website, when you own a website, what are the different obligations that you need to fulfill? Yeah, so, so again, I, I think, um, I mean, obviously, even though we're not part of the European Union anymore, we are still really governed by GDPR, right? So again, I think GDPR is something that is kind of here for for the long term for us, right? So, you know, there's definitely, you, you need to be compliant in, in that regard, right? The one that, I mean, I, I use this service, it's, I, I, I think it's gonna be really hard for me to kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll spell it. It's I-U-B-E-N-D-A, right? So basically they help companies with um, setting up cookie policies, privacy policies, right? And, and basically they take care of the compliance of your, um, the, the back end of your, the, the boring pages that most people like no index, no follow because they're, they're worthless, right? But they need to have them, 
right? So you mentioned there like the impressums and so on, right? So it's kind of, you know, so basically Ayubenda, they they handle privacy policy, cookie policy based upon what you've actually got running on your site and based on where you're located, right? So if you say I'm gonna run in France, they, they'll tell you all the things that you need to kind of have in terms of compliance. Um, you know, but again, I, I would say it's it's worth your while to kind of get a, um, a kind of a local based um, like lawyer, financier, like an accountant of some description so that they can kind of tell you what you need to kind of provide, right? Again, I think I see too many companies try and wing it, right? Just to try and make it cheap, right? And that's fine if you're just trying to test the water with a test campaign, right? To just see whether it's worth investing money to move into a market properly, right? But once you actually get to the point where you are going to move into it properly, then, you know, spend spend some money, get a proper accountant, get a proper, you know, lawyer who can actually help kind of navigate the path and make sure that you stay compliant. Okay. Uh, it's currently 2 p.m. Uh, so that's the end of our uh, conference. Uh, do you have anything that you would like to say to our audience when it comes to uh, SEO, SCM in the United Kingdom? Uh, no, ju again, just, just like, you know, I, th I think, you know, we've been one of the, as, as a market, we've been one of the leading kind of um, sources of, of great talent, right? And I'm sure that we will continue to do that for as long as we have some of the good events that we've got going on. And, you know, hopefully we can kind of all get back to meeting up in pubs and sharing sort of stories and ideas over beers and, and wine and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, I, I just think for me, it's like, you know, I think we've done well as an industry to kind of hang in there. Uh, um, and yeah, I look forward to seeing everyone face to face at an event in the future, hopefully pretty soon. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jim. I look at the chat and I have not seen any any question, but as I said, maybe that was because I was on my mobile. Uh, and I really would like to, to thank you for all those uh, useful information. And um, and yeah, hope to uh, talk to you in uh, for real, uh, maybe in the in the next month on the the Let's hope so. be uh, over. Thank you very much, okay. Jim. Okay. Have a great Cheers. day. Bye.